I'm going to jump in. Um, we're, we're so thankful to have everyone here and we want to be, uh, you know, respective of your time. Um, so hello, my name is Shannon Kreider. I'm the Director of Education for Houston Center for Photography. And it is my pleasure to welcome you to HCP's Surface for Feeling online panel discussion moderated by Barbara Levine and featuring artists Kaman C, Alejandra Cartagena, Laurel Nakadote, and Odette England. Um, Houston Center for Photography is a nonprofit photo gallery, educational space, and publisher of Spot Magazine, and we're based in Houston, Texas. Our Words and Pictures series was founded in 2018 between photographers, writers, and thinkers of the medium, and we are delighted to host today's panel. Um, everyone, if you can, just please give us some virtual applause for our speakers. Um, I know you're all muted, so we can't hear it, but I know everyone's really excited about our talk today. Some housekeeping notes before we get started. If you haven't already, please put yourself on mute uh, using the microphone icon in the left-hand corner of your screen. And if you have any questions for our speakers, you can send me, um, Shannon Kreider, a message, and I'll share the audience questions at a Q&A at the end of the program. It's my pleasure to introduce our moderator, Barbara Levine. Barbara Levine is a photo collage artist, vernacular photography collector, curator, and author. Barbara, with her wife, Paige Ramey, built a vernacular photography collection of over 30 years they call Photomania, and in 2020, it was acquired by the Museum of Fine Arts Houston. Their collection of early vernacular pho photograph albums was acquired by the International Center of, photo excuse me, of Photography in New York in 2019. Trained as a photographer at the San Francisco Art Institute, followed by a graduate degree in music Museology, Levine served as deputy director of the Contemporary Jewish Museum and as exhibitions director at San Francisco Museum of Modern Art. And without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to our great host, Barbara Levine. Oh, thank you, Shannon. Really happy to be here with all of you. We have a great program. Um, I'm gonna say a few things about vernacular photography, then you're going to hear and see works from our four fantastic panelists. And then we will have time at the end for some questions. So let's start with the definition of vernacular photography, a term that a lot of people are uncomfortable with. It can be off-putting. It can be confusing. It's also referred to as found, anonymous, maker unknown. And it generally refers to photographs and objects ranging from personal snapshots, photo booth pictures and photo albums to mass produced souvenirs, photo jewelry, ID badges and mugshots and everything in between. And this often discarded abandoned orphan material in the past has been overlooked within the history of photography. But an exciting thing is happening um, as we are all saturated with digital images where every moment of one's everyday life can be captured, uploaded, shared, altered, reproduced, tagged, and archived. Artists, collectors, curators, and others are rediscovering the mystery and uniqueness of authentic artifacts of vernacular photography from the pre-digital era. And there's a growing appreciation for this material and how it adds to expanding the experience and history of photography. I like to say uh, that photography since its invention, like any great language, has proven itself to be extraordinarily adaptable to personal, artistic, and popular uses. People have always felt a permission with photographs to alter them, to collage them, to embroider them, to cut up, cut up, cut them out, write on them, you know, to use images to tell stories about themselves and their communities. I also like to say that vernacular photography or whatever term you're comfortable using is more about the impact that it has on us, what it does rather than what type of photo it is all photographs lose and acquire new meaning over time. And today we're here on the occasion of Odette, your Keeper of the Hearth, picturing Roland Barthes' unseen photograph book and exhibition. And with all of our panelists, who as artists are inspired by or who work with family and found photos as raw material with which to create their images. Um, we have with us today, 
Alejandro Cartagena, who lives and works in Mexico. His projects employ landscape and portraiture as a means to examine social, urban, and environmental issues. His work has been exhibited all over the world and is in the collection of major museums. Alejandro has also created several award-winning books. Um, in one of my favorite of his photo series, Photo Estructura, meaning photo structure. He recovers family photographs, snapshots, and tourist views from landfills just outside of Mexico City, and then manipulates and destroys them to create unique photographic objects. Carmen Say is a photographer, video artist, and educator. She received her MFA from Yale University and is currently teaching at Parsons. She has exhibited widely and her super powerful monograph, Narrow Distances, focused on the intersection of Asian and Pacific Islander and LGBTQ communities, was awarded the prestigious Aperture Portfolio Prize. In her work, she has said that as part of her process, she often looks at family snapshots to inform her construction of new images. Uh, Laurel Makadate is a photographer, filmmaker, video, and performance artist. She also received her MFA in photography from Yale. Her first feature film, Stay the Same, Never Change, premiered at the Sundance Film Festival and went on to be featured in New Director, New Director, excuse me, new films at the Museum of Modern Art and Lincoln Center. Her photo series, The Kingdom, was featured at Leslie Tokeno Artworks and Projects Gallery in New York City. This is an amazing series and I can't wait for you all to hear um, and see more of it. Um, Odette England is an Australian British artist who uses photography, performance, writing and the archive to explore relationships between autobiography, gender, place and vernacular photography. Her work has been shown worldwide and she has had prestigious artist in residencies in Massachusetts and New York. And of course, Odette, you are the originator of the Keeper of the Hearth Project and why we are all here today. Um, you've made a beautiful book and a compelling exhibition. So let's start with you. Um, tell us a little bit about the project, Roland Barthes, Camera Lucida, the Winter Garden photograph, and why vernacular photography is an important part of the project. Thank you so much, Barbara, and hello and welcome to everyone who is uh, watching and listening today. Uh, for context and for background, and I'm going to hover on this particular image on screen for a little bit as I talk. In 1980, Roland Barthes, a French literary theorist and author, wrote this book, Camera Lucida. And Roland Barthes is not a photographer, but it's a book about photography. And it's divided into two sections. And he wrote this book in the shadow of his mother Henriette's passing. And so it's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of trauma and loss and discussion about this photograph that he goes looking for after his mother passes away. And he wants to find a snapshot that he thinks and he feels best represents her essence and how she really was. And he finds this image of his mother Henriette at the age of five, standing next to her brother in a winter garden, a glassed conservatory. And this is the image that he speaks about at length in Camera Lucida, but he never reproduces it for us. It's not contained in the book. It hasn't been published elsewhere. And it's a fairly good chance that there isn't anyone on the planet alive today who has actually seen this winter garden image. Now, wow. it's because this, this, and I haven't spoken about this a great deal in thinking about the winter garden photograph and the idea of an unseen image. And I'm gonna come back to that in a little bit. But if we fast forward from 1980 to 2017, so 37 years later, I'm at the very start of developing this Winter Garden Photograph project. And the project has two parts. The first part, which Barbara mentioned, is a 320 page illustrated volume called, Keep, called um, Keeper of the Hearth, which is what Henriette's name means. So it's a very fitting title. And it contains 211 photographs submitted by 200 photographers, writers, curators, historians of photography, who I invited to contribute 
a winter garden photograph of their own. The second part of the project is the exhibition that's currently on at the Houston Center for Photography in which all of those images are on show through to the middle of January. So going back to the idea of an unseen photograph, in Camera Lucida, the way that we experience the Winter Garden photograph is through Bart's interpretation. It's his words, it's his phrases, it's his how he reads and understands this, this image that we don't have the privy of seeing. So we have to build up in our minds, pixel by pixel, frame by frame, foreground to midground to background and again, what this image for us looks like. And for each of us, as we navigate his words, we'll build up a different image of what this winter garden photograph actually looks like. But at some point, there are people who saw this photograph. It was seen probably by the photographer, certainly by Roland, assuming it existed. There's some theory that perhaps it was just a figment of Bart's imagination. It was probably seen by Henriette, perhaps by her brother. So it's not truly, truly unseen. Um, and so one thing in, that is worth mentioning in, in, in the book is that a lot of the focus is on images rather than on text. There are three essays in the book, but the images don't come with a description of the size of the print, what, how the print was made, the year it was made, all of that information is, is, is mostly unshared. So it's like a reversal of what Camera Lucida does. Um, if we go to the next slide, about a third of the book is made up of vernacular images and snapshots. And this is a great example. So this image is a snapshot of mine, uh, a found snapshot of mine. And so it's not really mine, but the image you saw before it, the, 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 the purpley one is an image by the artist Phil Chang. And he contributed, he used this snapshot to make a lumen print, which he contributed to the project. And if we go to the next slide, you'll see an example of just some of the winter garden photographs that others contributed. So on the left, you have an image by Eric Kessels of what appears to be a young girl standing in a garden, perhaps not a winter garden because she's wearing t-shirts and it looks like shorts. And then on the right hand side, an image contributed by Claire Graphique at the Photographer's Gallery in London with what appears to be a young girl and perhaps her father standing in what could be a winter garden. So, Vernacular photographs, a third of them contributed to the project, whether or not that relates directly to those people's interpretations of um, what a winter garden photograph might mean. Some of them are very literal, some of them are more metaphorical, but each of them function as a way of reading an image without the text, um, which is what Bart does for us in, in, in Camera Lucida, which is gives us the words, but no pictures. So it's entirely relevant um, that we're talking today about images as surfaces for feelings, because a surface read, whether it's ink drops on, a, on, on an object or, you know, staticky grain of, of, of a screen, is that we will speak to the image visually and then the image might speak back to us and that speaking back to us might come in very different ways. Well, it's just great. Uh... To, to listen to more of the process and, and about the project. Um, thank you so much, Odette. And it's such a great springboard to talk about the, the process and seen and unseen and working with found materials. So I wanna ask each of you to share uh, some of your images and tell us a little bit about the image you have in Keeper the Hearth Project and how the archival photos, family photos, or other forms of vernacular photography have influenced or informed or helped your process. So Alejandro, how about we start with you? Sure. Well, thank you everybody for attending this talk. It's uh, always uh, exciting to share where you're coming from uh, photographically and conceptually. Um, I, I wanted to like, I, I have some of the images I've been doing lately of these projects where I'm using uh, the archive uh, or actually a collection that I've been building the, the past four years. Uh, but I wanted to talk about like how I, how I am so excited about vernacular photography. And I grew up photographically in an archive. I was a digitizer for five years for a photography center. For, for, so for five years, I scanned 
thousands and thousands of images from three centuries, 19th, 20th, and 21st century. And that really um, made me question the other thing that I was learning about photography, which was the history of photography, this mandated and very structured way of what has value as a photography. And at the same time, I was looking at all these vernacular photographs or unintended uh, photographic uh, images that weren't done with any artistic uh, intent and thinking, wait a minute, I mean, aesthetically, there's the distance is so small between what I'm being told that the history of photography is and the canon of what we should look at and what we should strive for and the images that I was scanning from people's family albums in at the photography center that really made a conundrum in my head about where does meaning really come from does it, it is it actually the photographer's intention or is it the social construct around what photography is and what we've made photography to do for us it's this uh, seduction of nostalgia that's imprinted in photography and and we can't avoid it. And I mean, and, and Barth is the perfect victim of that nostalgia, all this writing about this single image. And it's not about the image, it's about the nostalgia. It's about this wanting for that image to mean something more than what it really is, which is a representation of a person, you know? So this these uh, images that you're seeing on the screen have to do with that effort of mine of, trying to ask the question, how does meaning get constructed in photography? How, 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 how have we invented or how has culture and society invented meaning through photographs? And the, the taking out of the people who are represented for whom the image was made, for me was the first attempt to, to say, wait a minute, it's not about who's represented, it's about the act, you know, we're getting together, there's a, there's a frame, there's, a, there's an object, there's lighting, there's all this construct behind the image. And maybe all those little structures, all those little things are what actually make the meaning in, in, in photography. And I mean, it's, it's just a, uh, an idea uh, because who makes meaning in photography? It's us. And, and again, I go back to Barthes. He made the meaning of that photograph. It wasn't the photograph itself. Or you can argue the other way. I mean, it, it, I think photography is so exciting because of that, because it's a wild thing. It doesn't, it's, it's not strained to something very specific. It can go east, west, it can go wherever you want, depending on who's looking in, at it, depending on the context where you see it depending on you know who's presenting it who's saying that they did that image i mean there's so many layers of how to interpret photography and i mean that was one of the things that really excited me about Odette's project and the image that i sent for the project is is of a little i am i'm assume i'm assuming it's a little girl i won't say i i know if it's a girl or not but it's about this little person who's in the middle of this tropical garden. It's not a winter garden, but um, I wanted to, you know, have that sensation or, or uh, give something to the book that maybe grounds directly to somebody else's or many of us uh, winter garden photographs, because we all have that image, you know, of that person that is not here with us anymore and which we treasure and project a lot of things to it. So, that is my work and uh, thank you for the opportunity to talk today. Oh, it's wonderful. I, I especially like your point about, um, you know, the question, how does meaning get constructed? And um, that, that's a perfect prompt, Laurel, for you um, to share your work. I'm happy to jump in. So I think we just have to advance the slide. Yeah. So, um, my, this is the image that's in the book. Um, Odette invited me after I spoke to one of her classes, I think two years ago now, I think it was almost two years ago. Um, and I showed this body of work to her students and then we had a conversation about it afterwards. Um, so this image is from a series called The Kingdom and it's 34 images that are um, made from snapshots of my mother's life 
and pictures of my newborn son. Um, my mother was very sick when I was pregnant with my son and she was very sick when he was born. So their first meeting in person was actually at her deathbed um, and he, she was never able to hold him. So, you know, as a photographer, I kept thinking, I never was able to make that iconic photograph of my mother holding my child. Um, and as a daughter, I felt I had lost out on this opportunity to share this moment with my mother. So around that same time, I started getting spam messages in my email um, from people who wanted, who said that they could fix anything, they could fix any photograph for me. And so I submitted these snapshots that span my mother's life with pictures I had shot of my newborn son. And I gave them the direction to place the baby in the woman's arms. And so, you know, I, I thought, if you can fix anything, can you fix this loss in my family? Um, and so what I got back were not perfect images, but they were images that were incredible in other ways. You know, the, you can um, go forward. The, the Photoshop is terrible. Um, and, you know, like the baby's too big. Um, you know, like the, the color balance is off, like he's too cyan and she's too magenta. They fail in so many ways, but they succeed in so many others. Um, in some ways you can go forward. Um, that's actually in Austin, Texas, that last picture. Um, in, in some ways the pictures are about this relationship that they couldn't have, but they also create a relationship through photography that, that couldn't exist. Um, and they're also a story about a woman's life in snapshots. I had to go through my, or I had the opportunity to go through my mom's belongings after she died. And I ended up finding snapshots just like tucked in books. Um, you know, there were a number of books that I started to donate and just flip through carefully, like before donating and found pictures I'd never seen of my mother. Um, and so in a lot of ways, I got to know my mother's first life before I was born through these snapshots I found like tucked into books after her death. Um, so it's about this life she had before I was born. It's about this life she didn't get to have with my child. Um, and it's about the way that ways that Photoshop can't fix things, but it might create something new. Um, something else that is really interesting to me about this project is that my son looks at these pictures now, he's four now, and he says, that's me with Grandma Mary. And so he looks at these pictures and believes that he sat on her lap and he believes that the, this, this happened. And the truth is that it, it did happen for him. You know, if he believes that these pictures are real, they are real. Um, and so they, you know, they serve as a sort of surrogate space for him to have had this experience. Um, you can go forward. So, you know, and they're funny, like they're funny in a way, like this one, she was holding a bonsai plant, but you know, like the person had to put the baby in the woman's arms. At one point they emailed me, one of the um, photo, you know, Photoshop people emailed me and said, this, this job you're asking me to do is too hard. I can't do it. Um, and to which I responded, please just place the baby in the woman's arms. And then they did, and you know, this came back. Um, you can go forward. So this one, it's interesting because that's actually my grandmother. Um, and I just kept thinking when I got this one back that my grandmother from the great beyond said, I'll hold that baby. So they didn't put the baby in my mother's arms in this one, they put it in my grandmother's arms. But I also felt like, there was some sort of intervention in that moment that you know she wanted to hold him to. Um, you can go forward. So, you know, this one it's funny. The person who did it decided to put him on her shoulders. So, <laughs> I guess photoshopping her arms down would have been harder. Would have been a harder job. Um, you can go forward. So, in this one, they had to take away her cat to put my son in her arms. Um, and go forward. So this is the last picture I shot of my mother um, before she got very sick. Um, and it's among the first pictures I ever shot of my son. So it was this moment where I was able to meld the end of her life with the beginning of his life. And, you know, he looks like a like new person, like a brand new baby that's sort of, you know, floppy and can't hold his neck up. And, um, you know, she's, 
in this incredible space, but clearly having, you know, problems towards the end of her life. So um, this for me was this, you know, it was, it was a picture I shot actually. So um, still a snapshot from her life, but it was a way of sort of connecting these early photographs found in her early life to um, the last picture I made of her. So I feel like the only other thing I was gonna say is that my mother was born in Texas. So it's really great to show this work here today. Um, she was born in Texas and grew up in all these oil towns in the forties and fifties. And then um, she got married at 17. That picture of her as a bride is on her 17th birthday. Um, she got married in Austin and I was born in Austin um, some years after that. So thank you uh, for having me. Wonderful, gosh. It's so wonderful to, uh, you know, I've seen these pictures, but to hear you speak about them, it just, um, it, it just gives them that much more life. And, um, you know, it's interesting about adding the picture of your son in and, and comment, it makes me think about your work and that you have a very different process um, with how found photos or, per, or family snapshots how they influence your work. So why don't you tell us a little bit about your work and process now? Um, sure, thank you. Laurel, those, those are amazing. We should, we should jump in and talk about Laurel's work. No, um, I, um, this, let me just rewind. Everyone, well, thank you everyone. And um, thanks Odette for inviting me to be a part of this amazing project. When Odette um, asked me to think of a photograph to contribute, I kind of, I just, um, I knew it would be this picture here. And actually it's, this is a picture within a picture. And so the first contribution that I made to, for Odette was actually just that small print, uh, the black and white print that's being held by um, our hands. Uh, the, the child on the very left of the frame is my mother uh, when she was 10 at her um, oldest brother's wedding in Hong Kong in 1964. And, um, you know, I, growing up, I always asked, like, where are those family pictures? Where are the pictures of you as a baby? Um, where's the pictures of you and your siblings? And, you know, you know, they just didn't, you know, my mom always said, well, we just didn't, we were poor, we didn't have any money, we didn't have a camera, we couldn't go to a studio. So the very first family photographs were of, um, a, you know, a major event, like a wedding. Um, where like sort of, you know, there is a hired photographer sort of walking around. And I didn't find this picture until I um, started returning back to Hong Kong after college and spending a lot of time with family there. And uh, through my aunt and uncle's um, albums, like found this picture. And it, it, it was the early exi earliest existing photograph of my mom. And so I really think a lot about even who gets to be seen or who gets to be imaged. Um, I think a lot about who gets sort of left out of the archives and vernacular photography and who, who has means to a camera or a means to a studio, um, or even the idea of families. Like, you know, my, my, um, both of my grandmothers sort of came from sort of like broken, fractured, fragmented families where they were given away by their biological um, moms and sort of individually uh, spent a lot of time in their lives sort of finding long lost siblings and, and, and so forth. So like even the idea of trying to build a sense of family and chosen family as well, just as like a queer photographer, like what does that even mean? So that's sort of what informed like how I made this new picture. So I actually contributed two to Odette's project and this was made after like so much, I kind of be like, Odette, give me time. <laughs> I'm trying to think of a picture um, to make. And so I, on a trip back, I was, Going back to Hong Kong a lot was pre-pandemic. Um, a trip back, we looked at the albums again, and I held this picture with an aunt and uncle. And so, in this sort of holding, like even and just thinking about Laurel's holding pictures, like to hold something, it's so like tactile and tender, and um, is reciprocal. It's a sense that's like a you know a touch. And so here we are holding this photograph, and my aunt is not the person getting married. She's actually fourth in, in the, um, in the black uh, capo, um, gazing on the camera. And she's actually 17 in that picture. Um, 
And so, and that's her husband on the other side of the frame or holding the other side of the picture. And it's my hand with a wedding ring I'm married. And, but, you know, in Hong Kong, you know, you know, um, gay marriage is not recognized. So it was important for me to be like, this is a wedding picture. I'm showing my wedding ring in the picture as well. And my right hand isn't in the frame because I'm making the exposure in a four by five with a cable release. We can go to the next slide. Um, so those are like the more it's sort of like more direct way of like working. But, you know, I also am just informed by these sort of these family, uh, you know, from this is from the same album from that wedding album in 1964 of my oldest uncle's wedding. And this is my grandmother who I just talked about and just like how these pictures are amazing. I could never make this picture with a four by five, <laughs> just all the gestures and all the layers. Um, and even sharing and looking at this now in the context of the pandemic of like who can clink glasses together or dine together or share a meal together and or even celebrate these life events together in the same space. Uh, you can go to the next slide. Um, but even like this head in the foreground that, with the flash, like even those little mistakes or maybe it's not a mistake and the eye contact and that sort of happens throughout the, the frame even that figure on the far right that's looking out at the photographer. Um, so all of these little little details and has sort of pictures that I really study and, you know, uh, little gestures that um, really sort of speak louder. Let's go to the next slide. Um, so in here, this like picture, I was really trying to think about how do I frame someone? How do I um, sh like, you know, make a portrait of someone like within a space, like within an environment and with figures around that aren't really paying attention to the camera. And they're the two men like create this heart shape that frames the protagonist. Um, and it's just sort of like little things like to turn ahead and to acknowledge the camera the, um, and how to sort of build, build a frame through, you know, from left to right and front to back. And then you can go to the next slide. So these are from Narrow Distances, the book, um, that I published with Candor Arts in 2018. This is a vernacular picture on the left, a snapshot um, made of my father at work. Um, when we immigrated to the United States, my parents found work in Chinese restaurants. And so that's him just chopping meat. And I uh, made a series of self-portraits as my father. Um, and that's the, this, the one on the right is the new photograph from 2017. Can go to the next slide. This is a family picture I always loved, and um, this was the first apartment we moved to when we moved to the United States. That's me in the corner in the back. Um, and that's my mom and that, that's, my mom is holding a bowl that obscures my uh, sister's face. And like her thumb just like fitting perfectly underneath her bangs. Um, and then go to the next slide. And so then I like try those same moves of like a bowl obscuring the face. and. Um, they're really sort of minor things and but that's sort of like when I'm trying to build a photograph using a view camera to looking back at all of those um, those really small gestures and details of the quotidian. Go to the next slide. I think that's it. Oh no, that's not it. And the same here, like the it's really the idea of this is called steak face. And so this is a family portrait I made of my wife and my parents eating sharing a meal together. Um, and so I'm really also thinking about what does family mean and how can we be more expansive about thinking about family and like what is a chosen family and what can kinship mean and how can I queer a family photograph? And to, see even, to even make this picture took years and years of um, really like a lot of struggling and a lot of conversations with my parents to get them to even like evolve to a, a place to share a meal with my partner and, and wife. Um, and so in that way, it's like all the sort of work that takes to build a photograph is also relationship building as well as, you know, yes, that is a dog under the table. <laughs> <laughs> um, and go to the next slide. And so in the narrow distances in that book, it's really also about finding the, un like the, we already talked about the unseen, like finding, a, the queer family and finding a chosen family through 
this long series and this long project of portraits within the um, queer community in Hong Kong. I think that's it. Mm. I love how your, um, you know, your your relationship with the found photo, your family photos. Um, you've been able to make a bridge to not only create new family, but also to to create a line between your birth family and your new family. I mean, there. It, it's so powerful, the gestures that you're talking about from the snapshots. And a lot of times with the head in the foreground and things that people would just delete automatically today, you know, we have a greater appreciation for the light, for how candid it is, how every element is what makes that photograph so deeply felt. Um, Odette, do you want to talk to us a little bit about your work and process? Sure, thank you very much. And this is terrifying going last. Um, I have two very short performances. So you're going to hover on a black screen. I'm going to be doing a reverse of, uh, well, I'm, I'm doing what Bart actually does. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk you uh, this photograph that I submitted to the project. A colour photograph, taken with a Polaroid camera, taken in 1976 in rural South Australia. Square format, three and a half inches, an off-white border, marks of wear and love, of being held and being passed around, passed down. Taken by my mother, age 21. She has crouched down to make this photograph. The camera belongs to my father, her husband, who is 29. There are two people in the photograph. On the right, a man, my grandpa Jack, aged 66. On the left, me, aged one. The camera is close to us, perhaps three or four feet away. It is summer, February. We are in Grandpa Jack's garden. Nana's garden, really. There are pink flowers in the background, daisies and geraniums. Nana won, won many a community prize for her garden. Grandpa Jack is kneeling. He is in focus. He is looking at me. He is wearing one of the short sleeved collared shirts he so often wore, fawn with a printed square pattern. He is also wearing brown trousers, but he was colorblind. He has a full head of hair and his skin is tan, a gardener's tan. You can see where the brown stops and the white starts. His arm is outstretched, cupped under my right hand. He is doing this because I'm holding something. Perhaps he is worried I will drop this something. Perhaps he is inviting me to put it in his hand. It could be a plant or a biscuit or a piece of wood, I'm not sure. It's too small and too blurry. I am out of focus and partially out of frame. I'm looking to the left, perhaps at dad or Nana or something else entirely, or nothing at all. I am wearing a sleeveless blue and white jumpsuit. I have blonde hair, yellow blonde, short and curly like dad. I look like dad. I look like him still. Neither grandpa Jack or I are smiling. Neither of us is performing for the camera. In the distant background across the dirt road in front of my grandparents' home, which was built by uncle Ray, there is long dry grass. It's yellow and brittle. And standing in the field, there are a handful of cows. There are tall gum trees, old trees, older than Grandpa Jack. Over his shoulder, I can see the hill where Dad and Uncle John used to race billy carts over and again. This is my winter garden photograph. I am showing it to you, or will do shortly. It exists only for me and perhaps my parents. As Bart wrote of his winter garden photograph in Camera Lucida, for you, it will be an indifferent picture. But I have attempted to circumvent that indifference with text, with context, with my voice telling you a story, a true one, describing what is both in and out of the photograph, what is known and unknown, and what is seen and unseen. It's a story that includes a man who hated having his photograph taken and never once looked into the lens 
a girl who looks like her father, who loved watching him make photographs, who grew up to become a photographer, and a woman who rarely appeared in family photographs because she was the maker of our paper memories. This is my winter garden photograph. Just beautiful. Really interesting to have the experience of listening to the text and it's such a visual text and then looking at the photograph. Now, I have a question for you, Odette. Is this a photograph that you found or is this actually a family photograph? This is actually me and my grandpa, Jack. Okay. That's what I thought, I just wasn't sure. No, it's a good and important question to ask. <laughs> yes, yeah. Um, it's, you know, it's so fascinating. All of, uh, all of you are talking about absence and presence and, and family and um, interpretations of family. And um, I think this is a time where we can kind of all absorb what we've just been hearing and and talk, uh, you know, feel free to discuss. Um, I I have a question for all of you, which is some some in some ways you've you've answered, but I'm hoping that you'll elaborate a little bit. My question to you is that wh why are we as viewers um, and artists attracted to looking at snapshots, family photo albums of people we don't know? I mean, I think we know why there may be our own family photos of people we don't know in the family or other people's photos that we uh, get seduced by. Um, so that's, I, I'd like to just go around and, and, and talk about that informally. Um, why are we attracted to looking at old photos of people that we don't know? Um, Alejandro, do you want to jump in on that one? Um, I guess we all have different whys we do, of why we do that. Uh, I remember when I moved from Dominican Republic to Mexico, uh, I was 13 and I basically, it was, I cut off my life uh, with my friends and my family there. And the photo album, even though they, I knew the people, uh, in, in the images were an opportunity to create uh, a story that, you know, grounded me somewhere. And I mean, some people have the opportunity to have family albums and some don't. And I think a, a photograph is always that an opportunity to, to think of yourself outside of yourself in comparison to somebody else, in comparison to another uh, way of life. And, and so, and I don't know, maybe in a way they are a mirror, you know, they force us to think who we are and how we've built our life and how we are living our life. So, I mean, that's, that's one thing. I mean, there's so many things that I mentioned before, the idea of nostalgia, just, um, you know, how, there's such a duction in photography, you know, and, and images that look old because uh, maybe we've been told that in the past life was better. And so, you know, something that represents the old life, the thing that has passed um, is, is very attractive to look at. And we don't even question it. We just fall, fall for it. We fall for it because you can't do any, you can't change that image. You can't change the the past um it's it's there it's inscribed in in that piece of paper so there you can question it as much as you want but in the end it'll always be the same image i don't know there, that consistency has it's kind of uh i don't know it made me feel a little bit sad but at the same time it's it, it there's hope in in looking at the past because you know you can see yourself how you've grown like I said, you know, think, think who you are. So, I mean, those are many, and I think there's many more ways of why a photograph, an old photograph is so attractive. 
Yeah. Laurel, what do you think? Hmm. I think Laurel's mic is off, is on mute. Oh, sorry about that. You can hear me now, hopefully. Um, so I, I tapped out some, some quick notes last night when I was trying to put my kid to sleep. So these are just some quick ideas that I sort of came up with while also remembering to pack the juice boxes for the, the pre-K party today. Um, so photographs are time capsules. Um, photographs of strangers allow us to meet people who were born a hundred years ago who, who we never could have known. Um, they allow us to be parts of worlds that we were born too late for. Um, they are evidence that someone loved someone. They're um, evidence that we're all just trying to be part of something. Um, something that I, I, I found when I was going through my mother's snapshots was I found one photograph of um, my great grandmother and on the reverse was handwriting that I had never seen before. And I realized it must have been the handwriting of my great grandmother. And it was the only, you know, um, example of that that I've, I've ever seen. And so that photograph not only allowed me to see that image of her, but it served as a space for handwriting. And I feel like that's something that I find just incredibly important about old photographs is what's on the back. Um, let's see, uh, I grew up going with my mother to um, auction houses a lot. She loved to go to old auction houses. And so from a very early age, I would go and like dig through stuff and look at pictures with her. Um, I'm sure that that's part of why I love old photographs. I'm also very interested in strangers. Um, I've spent nearly 20 years making work about strangers and about chance encounters. And I feel like the possibility in an old photograph is a chance encounter, right? It's this chance that you can meet this person who's maybe no longer alive and, and certainly someone you haven't met yet. Um, I, I have that in common with you. I spent a lot of time being dragged around when I was a kid by my mother and my grandmother to antique shops. And um, so I was left alone a lot because they were always ogling China and sterling silver. And, and I would just look at pictures all the time. And, uh, and as an only child, I always felt like I was crossing paths with people that um, like from other worlds or other time periods or crossing paths with people that I would never ever cross paths with. Um, yeah. I also want to say something about the handwriting on the back. Um, I am so keenly aware today that, you know, on all these social media platforms, for example, um, you know, a lot of the captions and the expressions are independent from the image. And at some point, those are going to be permanently separated. So all those voices of pictures from people writing or dates or locations that we now have the benefit of, we won't have the benefit of those um, because of the limitations of digital platforms. Um, I totally agree with you. And I feel like, you know, as I went through essentially what became my mother's photographic archive, um, I just was so grateful for the writing on the back. My, her mother, you know, would write extensively at an angle on the back of the photographs. Um, and I just felt so grateful to have access to that writing. So, you know, photograph as holder of text as well. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I think that's that, those were the sort of notes I tapped out at, at bedtime, but I am excited to hear what others say too. Yeah, yeah. Um, Kama, what, what do you think? Kama might be muted, sure. Are you muted, Kama? I'm muted. I'm sorry. I was just talking <laughs> while on mute. I was thinking Rewind. about that <laughs> a lot. <laughs> I was thinking about that a lot too. And even like to start with like, why am I even drawn to photography or why am I a photographer? And and it's like, it, you know, it's, it's, it, I'm drawn to, I'm drawn to these family photographs and also just, you know, like 
photography in general because it allows me to connect. It allows me to connect with people and to build meaning and build connections. And But at the same time, it reflects really like, and I'm like paraphrasing Robert Giard, but like it reflects our desire or will to know, but at the same time, the very limits of what we can know. And so that I'm really interested in that tension as well um, in terms of the going through the archives as like the family photographs, but also even as someone who works with people, um, you know, attempting to even make a portrait with someone, whether it's a loved one or a really good friend or, you know, someone I just met. So that's, you know, I, I really, I'm drawn to that tension of the will to know, the desire to know, yet we are, we cannot know fully, deeply, like, the, you know, or even describe the essence of a person. It, it's interesting that you should say that because I think that's part of the lure of found photos is this understanding, this tacit agreement that we will never know. And there's a kind of relief in that to enjoy the picture and to have an experience with the picture because you're not being told how to experience the picture. You're not being told usually anything about the picture. Um, and so it's a kind of private space, if you will, between you and the picture. Um, and inevitably um, your read of the picture is completely subjective based on who you are. Um, and I think that is a very different experience in photography, even though I think, especially with portraiture, contemporary portraiture, of course, it's just human nature. We all project ourselves on, on, on pictures that we see, but there's something about the found photos, the anonymous photos, the photographer unknown photos, where that's expanded. Um, I don't know if any of you have that same experience, um, of what I'm saying. Um, just how different it is to look at found photos versus photo. It, it's like Alejandro, what you were saying earlier, you know, we are, we are prone to give more value and more meaning to pictures. I mean, I'm not, I'm a very, I'm a champion of the photographer unknown, but most of us are prone to giving more value and meaning to pictures where we know who the photographer is, or if the photographer happens to be, um, famous, for example, um, than we are to photographs where we don't know any information about it. Even if our experience looking at that photograph is just as powerful, we tend to give more value to the other photograph. Yeah, um, to, to, to that extent, I mean, the pho photography and, and the meaning of, of, of what's in the photograph it can be a very personal thing. And why an image is made when it's in the, in the realm of you know, a picture, a family picture, uh, when you find those images years ahead, that's what has happened. And this is what I think happens is that it has, um, it's, it has, it, it has expired as, it, it was created, you know, photography expires. And when you find images that have expired, the meaning is open, you know, and we can come in and re, 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 rethink of what that image means. And that's, I think, one of the things that attracts a lot, at least me, of uh, to buying old photographs is that all those images have, have expired the, the original meaning, the original intent has disappeared. You know, there's nobody backing up the feeling that was attached to that image anymore. And that's why they become garbage or that's why they become discarded uh, because, sorry about that. <laughs> uh, uh, because that meaning is no longer wanting to be inscribed in, in that image. So they become, you know, wild things, they become, for, they become open for somebody to take and reinterpret or not even maybe reinterpret, just like you said, just to feel free to enjoy the image as the image because we are so saturated with all this 
finding the meaning of, of what's in the photograph, especially uh, talking about the photography world, uh, that to find this image that, you know, it's loose, it does, it's, it's open, it's, it's, a, it's a comforting experience to find those kinds of images. I think you want to say that the people expired, not the photograph expired. No, the I think both. Photograph has actually lived on. Yeah, well, they, they they do exist, but the meaning or the intent for why that image was made, I think, somehow expires, and that's why they they become discarded. You know, because whoever wanted that image, that portrayal of their father or their mother. They don't. They're not interested in in that in for that piece of paper to hold that affection towards that person anymore. That be because they died or because you know there was a robbery and people threw away the image and you know it's a maybe that's a Latin uh, meaning or a Latin feeling that is inscribed in that image. But we don't know. We just find them discarded. We just find them in the garbage. You, you can't know. That's also really attractive, like you were saying. Odette, what do you think? <laughs> You're also on mute, Odette. Thank you. I, I agree with a great deal of what each of my fellow panelists have said. You know, I, I think we love to learn through images. We love to learn what we don't know. We love to build stories through images of people we don't know. Um, I, I really love what um, Carmen said about the limits of what we can know. And actually this, this, this was not planned but, and, and timing wise, but couldn't be better timed. If you go to the next slide, um, that's, I'm, I'm showing you a snapshot. I was thinking about the answer to this question and I pulled this snapshot of mine and fortuitously, I'll tell you a very short story. I'll read you the story um, because it performs and explains and adds to what each of the panelists have said about, you know, in answering this question, why we're attracted to looking at snapshots and family pictures of people that we don't know. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you this short story. Dad always wore a red terry toweling hat summer through winter, presumably replaced over the years in the same style. I wanted to be like dad, so naturally I had a red hat with a pom-pom, hand knitted, probably by mum. This I know from this photograph. It's winter, the clothing is the giveaway. The cement floor is dad's dairy and it's wet. It's after morning milking, after mum has wrestled the heavy duty hose to wash away the shit. It's also late enough that other farmers have arrived having done their girls and eaten their breakfast. Mum took the photograph with her Kodak Instamatic that lived in a tatty wicker basket atop the refrigerator in the southwest corner of her kitchen. There are five men in the picture with me. No, I am with them. There are five men, dad in his red terry toweling hat Uncle Ken, Grandpa Jack, Mr. Jenkins and Uncle Mervyn. All have sideburns, save Grandpa. The men would never have posed for Mum and Mum wouldn't have thought to ask. It's not an image of the men, it's of Dad's original dairy. It's not the dairy I remember though, the herringbone swing setup. Two lanes either side of a sunken concrete pit, six cows standing in each lane, single file. Dad in the pit at udder level, changing over the milking machines and ever watchful of his girls raising their tails. Thinking about leaks, injured teats, obstructions in teats, web teats, abnormal milk, bloody, clotted, watery. Interesting things live out the si outside of the rounded corners of this snapshot. I was terrified of Uncle Chris. Mum called him that. He was always Mr Jenkins to me. Mum knew that he was at the farm because I'd start screaming from wherever I was outside, but no one knows why. The photograph was taken in June 1976. It says so on the back in blue biro, Mum's semi-cursive handwriting. All hands working to set up temporary dairy. No one is working in the photograph, they're all talking shit. The film was processed and printed in February 1978. 
Mm. It took that long for mum to find other worthy photographs or time to make other worthy photographs. Dad is 29, mum is 21, I am 15 months. And my brother, who was born in January 1977, is not there, but is because my mum is pregnant. And it's possible no one knows this, including her. Mum likes to tell the story of the day I took myself for a toddle to the dairy. They couldn't find me for ages. How long is ages? They call and call until mum spies the red pom-pom bobbing up and down from the inside of a burnt out stump. I have made it halfway down our mile long driveway. My hands and face are smudged with charcoal and cow shit so dad's binoculars confirm. But there is no photograph of that. Ah, thank you, Odette. That's just wonderful. Yeah, and I wonder if there hadn't been that notation on the back, do you think it would have changed your experience of the picture? I think it would change what I was able to know about the picture because there's things that I can know from looking at it and it being a picture of mine. Of course, I don't remember it being made, but I wouldn't have known the date or the year or the fact that my brother was on his way mm -hmm. or who those people were necessarily because I can't, I can't recognise them all except for my, my dad and my granddad. Um, I mean, and are you, are you ever inspired by any of your family photos to create a text, to write stories, um, whether they are real or not? I do. I write a lot of stories. Usually they're true, but mostly, Barbara, as, as a lot of folks know, when, when I get my hands on a family snapshot, I'm usually cutting it up yeah. or cutting myself out of it or burning it or staking it or doing some, or hole punching it or doing some other hideous act of destruction, which for me isn't a, a destructional thing. It's much more of a, a curiosity space and a, and a reframing of identity and a, and a, a re-choreographing of story. So the fact that this one is still intact probably says a great deal about this picture too. I mean, you make me think about the, um... You know, I, I feel like we're living at a time right now where many photographers, um, artists, you know, uh, want to make pictures. Um, th there, there's been a, there was a, used to be when the old Kodak how-to guides were first out, it was how to make pictures. And then somewhere along the lines, it transitioned to how to take pictures. And now I feel like we're moving back because of such an appreciation for interacting with a photograph uh, of making pictures, which has a long history, uh, like I was saying early on, of people cutting themselves out of the picture or writing directly on the picture or, and they, they weren't artists necessarily. I mean, maybe they were, we will never know as we've been talking, um, but stitching, it's interesting for me as a collector to notice how much stitching is now, you know, um, artists are exploring that. I think, I think Odette, you have also been doing some stuff with stitching maybe um, and um, cutting, uh, burning, all this kind of permission with using photographs as raw material to express oneself, the making instead of taking a picture. Um, do any of you feel, um, well, Laurel, I'm, I'm particularly interested because um, you, you know, you had that job, you know, you, you, you outsourced it, if you will, to have somebody make these pictures for you. So your relation, you know, was obviously something that you envisioned, but do you feel like it was a form of making a picture or taking a picture or it does was, it matter? Uh, for me, it was certainly making a picture and that act of making was very important. Um, it was also important to me that a stranger made it for me, that a 
stranger interacted with my loss and tried to fix it for me. Mm -hmm. um, it was a way of connecting with the world and hoping that the world would return this thing whole. Um, so it was something that was very much made and, and hoped for. Yeah. Um, well, yes. Sorry to interrupt. There, this this pairs nicely with an audience question, if you don't mind me uh, sharing oh, that. But great. We had a, an audience member say, sometimes writing is on the front of the photo, even on the people in an attempt to preserve family history and names. Is this a destructive or constructive process? So I just wanted to add that because I think it fits in nicely with your conversation. Um, well, if you ask me, um, it's neither. It was obviously part of the relationship that the person had with the picture of wanting to identify the people, um, maybe to for future generations. Um, also, it was very common on the back, like maybe it wouldn't be a name, it could be a number, and then you would flip the picture over and everybody would be identified by number. Um, you know, constructive or decon or destructive. It, it, it again, it gets back to what your relation. Like for me, I love when people write on their photos because, first of all, it 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 makes the photograph, it makes the snapshot more palpable for me. It's more visceral because I think, like somebody said earlier, you know, it's like the first time you ever saw that person, I think Laurel, that person's handwriting. So it's it's like, it's a person, you know, it's not just like this camera snapshot. The, the writing adds this whole other layer to it. I don't know, how do other people feel about that question? I think it's more informative than anything. And it also relates to where the image might live. A lot of images, vernacular or snapshot images that I've looked at where the text has been written or typed in some cases on the front is because it's lived in an album. And so if text were written on the back, it wouldn't be able to be seen. And so oftentimes it's the name of the person or the place as an identifier than it is about destructing or constructing something. It's about its flatness and where it lives in the album so that that detail can be seen because sometimes the surface of the album or the surface of where it lived, the kind of surface in the album, it wasn't possible to write on or to place text on. That's why those early photo albums with the black paper were so wonderful because, you know, people, the, the, the page, it was a blank page. And so sometimes you get these incredible page compositions where people have arranged the pictures and then they've they've sometimes wound the writing around the photo or you know whereas then you know like all technology you know in the 60s it was like magnetic photo pages those like plastic photo pages where you couldn't you, you couldn't write on the photo page you know you had to write on the front or the back of the photo like you're saying Odette any other comments about that particular question? Shannon, any other questions you yeah. want to throw away right now? I have another question about the sense of collaboration um, between people who took the photograph over time through space. So, you know, for our artists, how maybe they feel in dialogue with um, our original photographers. I mean, I know that, you know, the first time I held that image I'm speaking about, I just kept thinking, she held this too. She held this as she wrote on it and she considered where the text would go. And she spent this time with this piece that now I'm spending with this piece. And it's in a way, you know, the photograph gave me this possibility of having this conversation with someone who died in 1918. So that was a really powerful feeling for me, just the sort of collaborative energy on that image was important to me. Um, and then of course the ones of my mother, you know, when I worked on that project, I felt that she was with me and I felt like I was having this experience with her during the making of it. And I felt like the strangers who interacted with it 
continued the story, right? They then, wherever in the world those pictures were photoshopped, that person looked at my mother and looked at my child and put them together. And so the story of that image continues with people I may never meet, but there's something important about that too. What's also fascinating, Laurel, too, is like then, you know, when you were talking about how Theo, your, your son, now looks at those pictures and says that happened. Like that's also another layer of collaboration of like, mm -hmm. you know, right. this building of this memory. And there's something also so real about this memory, even though it's constructed. Um, and so like his, his participation, like he's also now a collaborator, you know, that's like what's so beautiful. No, I totally agree. And, you know, he'll pick up, there's like a card from the show at Leslie Tonkino and he'll take that card that's on one of her dressers that we have at our house here and where we live. And he'll take it and he'll move it around the house and he'll say, I'm moving Grandma Mary around the house. She's watching us, you know? And it's like, how is that not an interaction with a photograph that's very human, right? It's a very human interaction. And actually, come on, I think about your your images of, of like holding that that piece together that photograph together is like a further interaction with that experience and like creating like elongating that experience in time like really like taking this 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 time capsule right and opening it up together and having this new experience and then this sort of intimacy of the bowl like just eclipsing the face and then taking that intimacy and, and moving it into your own contemporary practice is like so moving to me. Like just, I feel like after we hang up, I'll still be thinking about what you said about that, that beautiful like choreography of, of, of this hand in time. And then the sort of ability to take that and move it forward into your own work is so moving to me. And I feel like I'll just keep thinking about that. Mm -hmm. yeah. wow. I, I might have a maybe a little bit more pessimistic take on on the question and and the idea of feeling this collaboration who with who took the pictures because somehow I'm 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 still not completely convinced and that's why I started to do the work that I started to do about the innocence of photography. And even those mistakes uh, that Kaman, you mentioned on, on how a photograph is taken, mistakes, composition, format, all that somehow constructs a way we see the world. And somehow, I don't know who made those decisions to, to how we see the world that, like that. And I think we should be uh, questioning a little bit more, how, how, how do we feel these things? Are, are those feelings really mine? Or where did I learn how to feel that way with a photograph? And uh, I don't know, I, I think we should question that a little bit more and not be so uh, romantic that images are the ones who are actually making us feel that way or, is it, is it a social construct that's actually making us think that we feel that way? I don't know, it's just a question to put out there. Well, it, it's certainly all part of the mix. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, it, and it, I mean, there's many ways to um, address your comment, which is a good one. I mean, first of all, in the realm of some of, of what we've been talking about today, you know, family and mother and children, those are, like very intimate, personal, almost physical sensations. Um, whereas, you know, if you swing the pendulum in the other direction um, and you look at uh, a photograph where the, the face has been cut out, yeah, you know, I mean, you don't know why the face has been cut out. But you, for instance, Alejandro, as a maker, you're, you're adding to the conversation 
you're actually challenging our sensations of um, how we respond to a photograph by willfully cutting the picture out. Yeah. You know? um, so your your pictures are very willful. Mm -hmm. You know, you're you're um, whereas other pictures are you know, more, more nuanced, more intimate. And I think, I, I think that that's the fascination is that photography embraces all of it. Yeah. You bring to the picture your own experience when you're looking at it. Uh, I know, you know, I'm, I'm jumping a little bit all over the place, but, you know, remember like in the 1900s, you know, there wasn't the kind of visual literacy that there is today. You know, um, and and yet at the same time, Eastman Kodak was kind of a brilliant marketer. And basically, from day one, we've always been told what makes a good picture. Yeah. And I think everybody here is challenging those so-called norms. You know, um, and and I think that whether and I think that that that's the greatest thing right now is to expand what a photograph is and what a photograph can be. Yeah. Um, yeah. Any even when we say, even when the original, I think it was a few questions back of like, um, do we, do we uh, take pictures or do we make pictures? I think even how we talk about photography, like, like taking is such a violent thing, right? And photography, yes, is a, you know, a social construct and is also like embedded in colonialist enterprise, <laughs> yeah. you know. Um, so like to take, to shoot, to capture, those, those are really violent words. And, you know, I think there's, there's a, um, there's a way, it doesn't have to be the sort of, there's a way to acknowledge and name that. And there's also a way to have, um, you know, notions of care or, or family as a conceptual framework as well. Mm -hmm. like well, the actual, to and to your mutual. point, uh, to your point, the origin snapshot was a hunting term. This is the moment that the rifle went off. So that's where the term snapshot comes from. So you're absolutely right to say that it has aggressive connotations. Um, and in fact, there was something early on, I think before 1900, that was called a, a picture rifle where you would, it, it was a hunting rifle that would, you, you would basically s simulate sh shooting birds with the rifle. So there's always been this history, this association of guns and cameras, you know, whether people are conscious of it or not. And, and that's the, the taking part. And there's also been this, um, I know when I was in school, um, and very interested in vernacular photography and found photography, um, I was roundly criticized because I didn't take the picture, you know? So my appreciation for the picture wasn't seen as valid because the only kind of valid picture was if you actually pressed the shutter. And I think, I think some of that still continues today. And, and I think there are there are still you know places in the art world where even taking a picture is nothing in itself. You just pointed the camera, you know. So you're pushing the envelope by not even taking the picture, just you know finding pictures. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I I think that um, I think because of the times that we're in, we're very lucky because I think that is shifting. Because I think, you know, seeing handwriting on a picture, seeing a, an, a picture as an object, um, seeing objects, you know, there used to be, people used to put photographs on their pistol handles. You know, photographs were put on everything that people had in their belongings as a way to personalize them. But my point with all of that is just saying that in right now, especially, you know, where we're all grappling with, you know, isolation and connection on top of everything else. You know, there is this, you know, we're drawn to looking at, uh, at, the, at the 
found photos because they give us hope in some way, hope for a better day, uh, an understanding that people came before us and what they went through and, and, how, and how, you know, things do live on even if people do not. Um, anyway, don't get me started on that because I could just get all like mushy and poetic. <laughs> um, um, any more questions, Shannon? Um, well, so we're running low on time, so I'm going to actually combine two questions. Um, the first is, what about the anthropological documentary value of found photographs? And then I want to follow that up with someone who had a question right after about, in this digital age, um, how are we dehumanizing ourselves by no longer having prints to touch and to view and share? And and does that, I, I think they kind of those questions combine well like by losing the touch of photographs are they are we documenting ourselves in a different way are we losing touch with our history well i think so i mean photographs were meant to be shared and passed around and pages of albums turned and it was a communal experience um and that's one example anthropological absolutely when you you know uh, for example, in, in, in the collection, I have lots of real photo postcards of the Mexican Revolution. Mexican Revolution was one of the first uh, photographed wars by amateur photographers. A lot of those pictures were staged. People don't know that. That's a really good example of this idea of, you know, things that were staged to, to make money. So postcard publishers could sell postcards. Um, so anthropological, absolutely. Um, but then I, I don't know, you know, dehumanizing, yes. Because like I said earlier, from my point of view, when the words, the captions, the handwriting, the voice gets separated from the image, which it will. Um, and, you know, people say, well, what's the first thing that you would take if your house was on fire? You know, this is a little all too real right now. And, you know, people are not going to like carry out their computers and everything. Like, if you do not print, out, in my opinion, if you do not print out the picture, it's a file. And so all these kids, I'm, I'm watching all these children grow up on social media. You know, I, I don't know if any of you have the same sensation. I'm watching all these children grow up on, on social media. And I'm like, what's going to talk about time capsule? what's going to happen to their memory and their understanding of their child, you know, like are the parents or whomever printing out all these pictures for the kids? Unlikely. I don't know, I don't know that it, um, I don't know that it's dehumanizing. I might push back on that a little bit because I think it's just expanding the way in which we engage with images. I think it's expanding our accessibility to different kinds of images that perhaps we wouldn't have visual access to otherwise. I think it's a good way for us to question the value of the image object and what objecthood does. I don't necessarily think it's good or bad. I just think it's good to expand the dialogue and the visual accessibility that we have to images. And I think it's probably like, if I think about, my parents who are baby boomers, their care about the object is probably goes back to some of the things that Haleandro said very eloquently and beautifully about that's how they were taught to understand a picture. The way my daughter interacts, my 10 year old interacts with imagery, I don't think she's going to be any more or less disadvantaged by interacting through images through a screen. It's just different. And difference is hard. Difference is really hard. Yeah, good points. And, and you, we, we have to think that this picture revolution and excess of images that we're living right now actually happened before with the, oh. with Kodak, you know? And cool. every, every professional photographer was screaming their heads off, this is gonna destroy photography, you know? <laughs> and here we are screaming again, you know, a century, a hundred years in the future, we're also screaming that somehow, and, and, and who knows, we don't know what's gonna happen, but it can destroy the way that we think of photography. Um, 
that is a beautiful way to think of photography, but like Odette is mentioning, there are different ways of how to enjoy uh, a photograph and how to think of the photograph. But yes, there is a danger to the digital, you know, have no electricity, that memory of, of many people are, is, it's gone, right? So there is a danger, a latent danger, but so is paper. There's fire, it can be destroyed. So I don't know, I think it, we're on a second wave of feeling uh, that photography or memories can, can disappear somehow or become very uh, banal and just, you know, not, not caring for them. Yeah. Well, um, any last questions, Shannon? I know we've about run out of time, but any last comments or questions? Mostly covered it. I, I want to say thank you so much to the panel and to, to our audience for joining us. This was just really fantastic. Um, so I, you know, I, again, you can't hear the applause the same way digitally, but um, we're so glad to have you here. And, and for all our, our guests, thank you so much for joining Houston Center for Photography. If you're in Houston, um, come see the exhibition and see this work in person. It, it is a, a giant exhibition. There's every time I walk through, I see something new. Um, so thank you so much for joining us and thinking about photography and, and, uh, and the value of, of found photography and snapshots and vernacular photos. So thank you, Barbara. Oh, my pleasure. And to, uh, I think Odette, um, I, I also want to say brilliant project. And I think your I know your book is available if people want to um, purchase it. How, how do they do that? They can do it two ways. If you're based in the US and you would like a signed copy, you can get a copy from my website, odetteengland.com. And if you are outside the US and um, you can get it direct from Shilt Publishing with both options with free shipping. And, you know, in this, it's so extraordinary to even have this exhibition up at this time that's available for people to see. And shortly, thanks to, you know, Shannon and Assad and Teresa and Sam and every, uh, Ashlyn, and everyone who has been or is at the HCP right now who has made this exhibition at all possible. Um, you know, Sam, I know, is doing some filming and that shortly there'll be a, a nice little video, piece of video footage of what the exhibition looks like. I, I have the most enormous thanks to you and to the 200 people who make this book and project what it is, because it is, it is not mine. It belongs to these 200 people, including these extraordinary four panellists and moderator um, who made it what it is. And I, I, I am deeply indebted to every single one of them. Well, thank you so much, Odette. And the book is also available in our gallery. Oh, wonderful. Yes, I had the pleasure of seeing the exhibition. So if you are in Houston, I encourage you, go see this exhibition. It's beautiful. Yes, it is a wonderful exhibition. We're so thankful for Odette for, for helping us put putting this together and, and, and building this project. Um, but yes, you can, and a video is coming soon. We also have virtual tours available. Great. Um, so check out our website. Thank you for, for joining us today. And again, thank you so much to our panelists for, for sharing your work and your words. Yay. Bye everybody. Thank you. Bye. Houston Center for Photography exists for and because of our community. If you enjoyed this video, please consider supporting us at www.hcponline.org give for your vital support during this unprecedented time. Thank you.